Welcome back, everyone. Let's start with the uh, second session of CFEL. And the first talk is titled Overfull Two Large Aggregate Signatures Based on Lattices by Katharina Budgust and Adeline Roux Langlois. And Katharina mm -hmm. will give the talk. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Very good pronunciations of the names. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's not working. No. Green button. No. Yeah. Okay. I can do it like this. No. Uh, in the worst case, I use the laptop. Okay, I actually need to go back. Okay, so now let's start. Um, so I will talk about um, two large aggregate signatures based on lattices, and the talk is divided in three parts. So I will first motivate and explain what aggregate signatures are, and then I will uh, show you how you can do that on lattices, and then finally um, explain our failure why they are too large. Um, okay, even though I think I'm in a cryptographic audience here, um, let's remind ourselves what the motivation of digital signatures are. Um, so the main motivation is to have a digital analog of handprint signatures, but um, I guess we also found out that we can even hope for a better security than in the handwritten um, analog and for even more functionalities. And it's exactly in this last uh, part where the aggregate signatures falls into. So just for notation, and uh, digital signatures is, uh, signature is composed of three algorithms, uh, key generation, signature, and verification. So I have Alice who wants to sign a message and she uh, generates a pair of keys, a signing key that is secret. So everything that is orange is si secret and then a verification key that is public in blue. And then she signs a message using the signature algorithm and sends it to the rabbit. And the rabbit uses then the verification algorithm to verify the signature and the message together with the public key. And if the signature was valid, uh, this algorithm uh, outputs one. And so there are two properties that we want to um, achieve with uh, signatures. The one is correctness. So whenever Alice really signs a message, then the uh, verification should always output one. And then the second property that we want is unforgeability. So it should not be possible for any other person than Alice to sign a message on her behalf. And then the uh, field of application of signatures are quite large. Um, I think it's whenever you need to authenticate anything. So opening your browser, you have a protocol, and then there's the digital signatures coming into play. Um, so now let's imagine we have Alice signing a message and the rabbit verifying it. And then we have another Alice also signing a message with her own secret key and sending it to the rabbit. So the rabbit has, so we have to send both messages and the rabbit has to verify both um, signatures. And then the research question uh, that you can ask if it's possible to use, uh, to combine both signatures into one single signature. And of course, more generally, can you do that with N signatures? And this is the concept of aggregate signatures that has been introduced by Bonnet and co-authors uh, in 2003. And you need two more algorithms now, aggregate sign and aggregate verify. And in the aggregate sign algorithm, you take, um, you take uh, the two signatures that has been produced by the two Alice's independently. So they sign, you take the two signatures, you take the two messages and the verification keys and you produce one single signature. And so you only need to send one single signature here. And then the rabbit uses an, um, an algorithm that can verify those aggregate signatures. Then in terms of properties, you still want correctness, you want unforgeability. As before, you slightly have to modify a little bit your definitions, but in a nutshell, it stays the same. But you want additionally that, of course, this aggregate signature is much smaller than the uh, sending the two um, signatures. That's, that was the initial goal now. Uh, so that's what we call compactness. And a last 
property is public aggregation. So what you want is um, that here the, I think I have, yeah. So what you want is that the uh, aggregate signature, aggregate sign algorithm only needs public input. So there's no orange into it, so only blue. So even a, like not only the two Alice's can do it, but anyone else. You don't, you don't need any secret information here. And in terms of application, um, yeah, so actually you, need, you can use it. It's useful whenever you want to save bandwidth. So the, what you need to send as a message, message becomes smaller. And um, so you can think of consensus protocols and certificate chains, but I think it attracted a lot more attention in recent years because it's used in, um, on blockchains. Okay, um, so I just listed it like this, um, but this last uh, property of public aggregation is really hard to obtain. So it's, it's really a, a strong um, yeah, requirement what you want. And so the research question I actually started with together with my supervisor at the time was, can we construct and aggregate signatures based on Euclidean lattices? And um, spoiler, yes, we can. Uh, we need a little, to be a little bit more careful than we have been. <laughs> Uh, so I will show you how we pre-failed twice. And, um, and then at the end, we were able to have an aggregate signature that, uh, that is provable secure, um, but that turns out to be larger than just the concatenation of N independent signatures. So you completely fail because that's what you wanted to have. And um, yeah, so let's move on. I have explained what are aggregate signatures. Now I want to show you how you can have signatures based on lattices. Um, so today I will focus on what we call Fiat Mia with Albert signatures that have been introduced by Leo Bershevsky. Um, I directly introduce it in the algebraic setting. So we have a ring of polynomials of degree less than n. And we consider the quotient R cubed and we sample a matrix A, uh, a prime uniformly at random over RQ with, um, of size K and L. And then we define a public matrix A, which is the concatenation of A prime together with the identity. And then we are in the random oracle model. So we have a random oracle H that maps a random bit string to a polynomial in the ring, but a subset which only contains short polynomials. And okay, not so important for today, but n is a power of two, q is prime, and k and l are small constants. And so we need to specify the three algorithms for a signature. So we have the key generation. So for the key generation, Alice samples a polynomial, a polynomial of um, dimension k plus l um, that is small. And when I say small, I mean that the polynomial has coefficients that are shorter than, they're much smaller than mod q. So mod q, you would have everything between zero and q minus one. But when I say small, I mean that we are more about like zero to very small constant. And, um, and then I, this is my secret key and the verification key is the product of this short polynomial together with, um, uh, by this matrix A that I have defined uh, above. So this is a secret key and verification key. And for the signing, I do, I again sample a Y, a vector of dimension K plus L with short, uh, which is small, and I compute um, the image with the public matrix A. And the second thing that I do is I compute now, I query the random oracle on this U. So sometimes this is called the commitment because it's an identification scheme. So I um, query the random oracle on the commitment U, on the message and the public key, and I obtain a challenge, which is a polynomial with small um, coefficients. And then I compute the response set um, as described here. And then there's one um, special thing with lattices that usually, um, yeah, you can't simply output the set in any case for your signature, but what you have to do is you make, because the distribution of the set now depends on the secret, because everything is small and then you could, yeah. So this distribution is, um, depends on the secret. And so what you do is you do rejection sampling to make this distribution independent of the secret. But it's not so relevant for aggregation. Um, it's, yeah. And then your signature is composed of the uh, commitment U and the response set. 
And now the third algorithm is the verification. So what you need to do is to verify that there is this special equation verified. And you also need to verify that set is indeed small. Okay. Um, for the correctness, you just plug in all the definitions. So you have um, Z, you plug in the definition of Z, and then you plug in the definition of the challenge C, and you plug in the definition of U, and then you see that this equation holds. Um, okay. So I, I was on correctness now um, regarding the unforgeability. This um, has been, yeah, it can be shown that the, this signature scheme is, un, is existential unforgeable, uh, assuming the hardness of a lattice problem that is called module learning with errors. So um, in images, this uh, problem says that you need to distinguish two distributions. The one distribution on the right is just a matrix A prime that is random and a vector B that is random. And on the left side, you have A prime random, but B sorry, now a vector that is a um, product of a matrix times um, vector of polynomial. And if you, um, if we go back to this slide, you see that the secret key and public key, so the public key is exactly an instance of the module um, learning with error um, problem. Okay, and oh, it's, an, it's a distribution like on the left side. And why is this problem um, interesting or why do people study it? Because it um, is presumably post-quantum secure, at least fingers crossed, <laughs> no e-print paper in the last uh, weeks. <laughs> and uh, it has quite strong security guarantees. Um, I will not go into detail here, but there are some nice worst case to average case reductions. And I guess that's maybe most the reason why module learning with errors problem is used so much because it's so useful. So you can really build many cryptographic applications on it. Um, that's a lattice because this is a lattice talk and for now you haven't seen any lattice. So I thought I will draw you one. Um, and the next slide is, um, yeah, we can actually celebrate because the um, blueprint of what I just showed you, this Fiat Tamir with Herbert signature, is exactly what is used in the Dilithium signature, which will be standardized by NIST. Yeah. Okay, um, now comes the failure. Um, okay, so I have the two Alice's, Alice 1 and Alice 2. They do the signature, as I've shown you, and so the first naive idea would be, so we are over ring of polynomials, everything is linear here, no? So let's just sum up everything. So what you can do is you take both U parts and both Z parts and you take the sum. And now you need to verify that the sum is correct. So you just take the sum of both verif uh, verification equations. But there's an immediate problem. It's not hard to see. Um, so the thing is that now you're on like, the rapid who needs to verify the aggregate signature knows only the sum of the u. So they don't know u1 and u2, but you need to know u1 and u2 in order to recompute the challenges. So in your verification, you need the challenges c1 and c2. They depend on the single u1 and u2, but if you sum it up, you don't know the single u1 and u2 anymore. So that is actually a problem that is known also in the discrete log um, setting. So the only thing we know to do is to um, half aggregate. So we can only sum up the set parts, but we have to send all the U parts. So that's half, half aggregation. That's the best we can hope to have, at least for now. And so we can do that. And now I show you why this is an intrinsic fail in lattice based in a lattice based setting. So there's a trick if I'm in the single signature, I just sign my message. There's a trick where I can save a lot of space. And because the U part is really not working. Ah, I do it with my fingers. So, um, so the U part is an element of your ring of dimension K and mod q. So the coefficients of this u part lie in minus q over 2 to q over 2 of dimension nk, where q is, if you take uh, practical uh, parameters, is like a 23-bit um, integer. 
But what you can do is replace this U by a C, the challenge, which is now a single real element with very short uh, coefficients. So usually like minus one to two, uh, one. And you'd simply, you have to adapt the verification equation, but the, the, the relevant observation is that knowing um, Z, then you can equally switch between U and Z, uh, Z, yeah. So I hope, yeah. So actually most of the time you will see the lattice-based signature where they already send the C instead of the U. And um, now comes the problem in the aggregate setting, this is not possible because we sum up the Z part, no? That was, that was the only thing we could still do was summing up the Z part, but if I sum up the Z part, I don't know how to go from the U to the C part anymore. Because, um, yeah, so this is exactly where I do it here, in A times C, A times Z minus TC is how I can move from U to C. But if I don't know Z anymore, I can't do this. So this trick does not apply in the aggregate setting. And now, if I use my half aggregation, so I have the single U parts and the sum of the Z parts, and I have the trivial concatenation of two signatures composed where I can I apply the trick, then the size of my aggregate signatures, which is larger than just sending U1 and U2, so I just ignore in my computations the Z parts, and I take the um, concatenation and compare those, and take, for instance, the lithium-3 parameters, then I obtain something which is more than five times larger. Um, yeah, so, um, and this has nothing to do with the number of signatures I'm aggregating, no? So it's just the U parts compared with the trivial signatures. So there's no amortizing effect that will ever come into play. It's just not possible. So that's our failure. And I think I still have a little bit of time. I didn't measure, you stop me. <laughs> yeah, uh, and okay, so well, we, we started a little bit late, but you still have. Okay, <laughs> then, so then, so as I already said, we failed. This is the failure, but we also pre failed before uh, twice. And so these are two things you should not do, but we did. And here I need to thank Thomas Prest and Akira Takahashi because they both sent us an email and pointed out those failures to us. So I'm, I'm happy that this is working like this in our community, that you write emails and tell the other that they fail. Um, so um, yeah, so the first thing is don't compress the U part. So actually, this is an idea coming from another paper and it's still like this online. Um, so yeah, just be careful. Um, so the, 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 you, you might wonder, so what you do is you plug in the U part so this is your commitment into the random oracle. But this element is, and this is why we failed before, is a very large element. So it's a ring element of dimension K mod Q, and it's much larger than what you would need for your random oracle to argue for some collision, like that is hard to find a collision. So the idea was, can't we compress this input to the random oracle via some function and be in just exactly the space where we need to be? like you compress it to um, set Q to the power N zero, and, um, and then we would save in space because you would then only, sub like you only need to um, send the compressed elements in your aggregate signature. And um, you need to do this with a linear function because you want to preserve the aggregation. No? So the aggregation was summing up the U parts so you need a function that preserves this linear um, structure else you can't aggregate anymore. And um, the problem is that this linear structure is also prone to attacks then. So um, yeah, so it, it's actually possible once you apply this aggregate, like this linear um, function, then you can attack the single signature scheme. It's not like you don't even attack in the aggregate model, you, aggregate, you can forge signatures even just for one person. And um, the idea is that you use, I think I will not go into details exactly, but so the, the, the idea is just that you used, use the linearity that you can use um, standard lattice algorithms to find a short pre-image set for this um, equation if you're in the, slower, in the lower dimension, and then you can lift it up easily in the higher dimension anymore. So don't try to compress the U part. It's uh, not a good idea, at least you do it in, yeah, you can't just use a simple, simple linear uh, function. 
And the second thing is don't use the simple sum. So that's what I actually presented. Um, but just for simplified version of the presentation, but you should not do that um, because there's an attack if you use the simple sum without any coefficients. Um, and um, I think I have the time to go through it. Uh, so um, the idea is then in this case, I can forge an aggregate signature on behalf of, the, of a person who hasn't participated. So Alice in, on the left in green, uh, has only published her verification key, but is not participating in the aggregate signing process. And at the end, we will have a signature that says that she signed the message, which it didn't. And the idea is that the adversary can now choose their own secret key, public key pair, and starts the signing for um, the Alice in green, honestly, so computing the U part and the challenge. But now they can't compute the response because they don't know the, uh, the, secret, the secret key. But what they do is they kind of shift their own commitment by C1, T1, so that in later in the verification, this will cancel out. So they shift their own commitment. And then in the aggregate signature, the sad part, they only take the U1. And then the idea is that um, now when you verify, then you just put your commitment that it cancels out the missing part of the not participating Alice. So the, so the relevant thing is that what you can do is you use the challenge and the public key in your own commitment. And a really easy fix is that you add random coefficients. So you have a random linear combinations instead of a simple sum, because now um, the set parts here, so this last, uh, it will not cancel out anymore. You can't, you can't pre add your, your shift, your commitment. And, um, but of course, if you do that, you should do this from a space, a space that is large enough so that it's not easy to guess the coefficients. So in this um, one paper I already cited, they have definitely a space that is too small. So it's also a concern. And so these were the two don'ts. I think I will conclude with um, a bit of related work um, so I have already mentioned MMSAT, um, but another thing is then you can aggregate. So there are different models of aggregation. I was really interested in the most like um, standard model, um, but the, you can specify, like once you restrict your model, you can have some results. So in the synchro uh, synchronized setting, there's a paper called Squirrel. And if you allow the two Alice's to interact with each other, that's also known as multi-signatures, then you can also have some, um, some results. So one will be presented uh, next week at crypto. And uh, the last thing is that you can also have a model where you sequentially aggregate. So you don't have all the people communicating with each other, but only like one after the other. And there are also results in this setting. And yeah, so we are currently working on something like this, sequential half aggregation of what I've just shown. And um, I think the open question is, can we have a lattice space signature that allows for public aggregation in this very standard model that is shorter than the concatenation of all the signatures and allows for proof um, of security? And yeah, so a problem also is, but this is a bit a side problem, is often in lattices you need to bound a number of people because uh, sizes matter and often if you take the sum, it increases the sizes. So you can't allow for arbitrary number of parties. So yeah, what can you do in this setting? And I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Katharina. <laughs> There's some time for questions. Uh, thank you for your talk. Yes. Um, quick question about the thing about the unbounded number of parties. Have you thought about using FHE techniques in this space? Is there a known immediate sort of reason why that doesn't apply? Mm. No, I haven't thought about this. So in the sequential setting, you can have it actually because you don't. Yeah. So in the sequential setting, there might be solutions with unbounded number of parties, but it's in it's in a yeah, I mean, communication wise, it's in a, in a specific setting now. So you assume that one after the other communicates with each other. Mm -hmm. So in the case, in a setting where you have um, 
everyone signs their own message and afterwards you want to aggregate them. I, there, there, there's no result on unbounded settings, so there could be, so maybe just for existence, like just to think about if it's possible, mm -hmm. maybe it would be better to think with more powerful tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And you have always the trade-off that you don't want to be larger than, I mean. Well, I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is I think we can make these even bigger. If we sort of add, you know, FHE, we can make the signatures even bigger than you've got now, probably. Yeah. And so that would be. Uh, you, you, you try to convince me for next year, see fail. Yes. Ah. Yes. <laughs> hmm. I see the potential is all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe there's another question. No? Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. For coming.